We're so excited to be in week two of our current series, When the Devil Comes Knocking. We're even more excited that you're here with us. Before we worship together, we wanted to let you know about a few things. First, if you're new and would like to learn more about COC, then Starting Point Online is for you. Starting Point is a five to 10 minute Zoom introduction to all the opportunities and options you have to get connected at COC. Text COCSP to 555-888 if you're interested. Next, we have all kinds of online ways for you and your kids and teens to stay connected daily. To learn more, just go to churchofcelebration.com and click on the Church Online Learn More banner on the front page. Lastly, we want to thank you for your generous giving during this time. Thank you for being a part of what God wants to do through our church in our current circumstances. If you would like to be a part of this mission, you can give anytime by texting GIVECOC to 555-888. Thank you for being here. Now let's worship together. Welcome to COC Online. We're very excited that you've joined us today. If you're on your couch on your cozies, let's get up and worship. I was going down, thought it was for the count. Then I found your love. Wandered off, thought I had gone too far. There I found your love. Fear I used to know can't stop me anymore. Cause I found your love. When I feel alone, I have a place to go.
man, God is so good. We're gonna sing about his good grace. is so good. We're going to continue to sing about his goodness today. We did this song last week. I pray that it ministers to you in such a powerful way today. i 
Jesus, we thank you so much for this time of worship. We thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives every day. Jesus, we are so thankful for you. And pray that as we hear from you today, I pray that we will open up our ears and be able to hear your voice. God, we love you so much. And we give you all the praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Church of Celebration Online. We are so glad you're here. And if you're a guest today, man, thanks so much for hanging out with us and choosing Church of Celebration as your place of worship today. I am so excited to move into the second week of our current series that we are calling When the Devil Comes Knocking. Let me start today with just a few questions. I want you to think about this at home today. Um, have you ever found yourself looking back at some messier moments in life and thought to yourself, how in the world did I make that decision? Or maybe something like, why in the world did I do that? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you've been there before. So with that in mind, let me ask you this right now. Do you think it might actually be possible that in those moments, you know, those moments when sin looked so good and so enticing and when God's logic, God's logic seems so illogical in the moment or when the wrong way seems so much like the right way that possibly, possibly there was an enemy behind those moments or maybe there might have been somebody else there. Have you ever been in one of those moments and thought about that? So here's what we're really after in this series. We shared these last week, and you might want to write them down. They'll probably be on the screens for you. But what we're hoping to do is help you recognize the real opponent that we have in life and what he's capable of. Then we want to personalize it. We want to kind of start taking it serious, taking offense to what uh, he's doing to us. And then what we want to do is we want to begin to strategize. And that is basically knowing um, how and when to fight who the real enemy really is. So here's what I want you to know from the start today. Everybody watching. Satan is the real enemy. And he's real and he's not fictional, and he's not allegorical. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it tells us a little bit about this enemy. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, here it is, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. Here's the reality today, folks. Scripture is very clear about Satan's primary tactics. They are to steal, to kill and destroy us. Last week, we identified that, that because of what happened with Satan in the beginning of time and what God did to him in punishing him, Satan hates God. That means if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the reality is Satan hates you too. And he's going to come at you with all that he has. So what we want to do today is switch gears and we want to talk a little bit about a few of the tactics. Why is Satan knocking to begin with? But before we do that, let me kind of set the stage a little bit so you understand. 
Anybody at home remember playing and learning how to play the game tic-tac-toe? Maybe it was a parent or a grandparent that taught you how to play tic-tac-toe. And wasn't it crazy that they took like this evil pleasure in beating you time and time and time again over and over? And, and they would be almost like taking advantage of you. And then when you were on the verge of tears after getting beat so many times and they were starting to realize that they might be scarring you you know, psychologically for life, they would tell you this. They would say, listen, Josh, do you know the strategy of this game? And I'm like, no, I don't have a clue of what the strategy is. You're, you're kicking my butt in this game. And they would then reveal the strategy. They would say, here's the first objective. If you have the first move, go for the center box on the board. Go for the center box. And then they said, never, ever, ever go for the in-between outside outer edge boxes, right? And then they would say, always then move tactically for a corner and try to capture a corner. And as soon as they were showing you this on the tic-tac-toe board, it's like the lights went on your brain. And as soon as that person showed you the tactics, it was like you saw the game for the first time and it was revealed to you. Once their tactics were revealed, you, you just suddenly knew what to do. And from that moment on, any time that you have ever played tic-tac-toe -tac before, uh, tic -tac before or again, you you've hardly ever been beaten, right? It's like you will either play to, to win the game or to uh, draw. My point with this whole opening illustration is this. Once the tactics in the war that we're in are revealed, the game can change. The whole idea of how to fight and, and knowing when to fight changes. So my thought question for you is, is what if this is the same way with Satan? Like what if, what if once you figure out the strategy and how he moves and how he operates, maybe just maybe you might be able to defend him a little bit better. The Bible actually says that we need to know how Satan plays. We need to be aware of his tactics or we're going to be in big trouble. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, that means not take advantage of us, not outthink us, not outtactic us, why would we want to be aware of that? Because it goes on to say in that passage that we're, we're unaware, we're unaware of his schemes. This is simply saying that if you and I can cross a threshold and get it, if we could become aware of how he works, then Satan is going to have a really, really, really hard time defeating you and outwitting you. So listen closely today, folks. If you don't know the devil's schemes, if you can't recognize his tactics, then he is going to defeat you. Every time that you face him, because his objective, remember, is to steal, kill, and destroy. So from the start, before we look, I mean, we're going to look at three tactics today. From the beginning, I want you to know that every one of Satan's tactics are centered on a lie. Every one of them. So let's take a look at a few of them today. If you got, if you got a, a pen or paper handy at home, then you can take the notes down. But here's, here's one of his first tactics. It's deception. Deception. This is probably uh, one of the areas that most all of us struggle with because this is, the un, this is the one area that's the hardest to recognize. Remember last week we said that how do you know when you're be, being deceived? You, you really don't know until like reality hits. And, and, and reality is, is, is here's why it's hard to recognize because the best deception is usually a really, really little one. Right. Because if Satan came to us and he told us something that was absolutely outrageous, then we would be able to see it miles away. So he's very subtle. It's sort of like this. Have you ever, you know, tried to get your kids to take medicine and they're just like completely defiant? They don't want to do it. So what do you do? You default to a little deception, right? You actually take the Tylenol, the children's Tylenol, and mix it with Kool-Aid and tell them, hey, you want to drink a Kool-Aid? And then they drink it. You, you're deceiving your children so they can take the medicine and get to feeling better. So when it comes to our enemy, you need to be completely aware today that you and I are in a tactical war of subtlety. That's very similar to that little illustration. And this is how Satan works. If he can get you and I to believe just a little lie long enough, 
and then actually act on it enough, right, often enough, then he'll be able to accomplish his mission in defeating you. Let me try to demonstrate this a little bit more for you today. Let me ask you this at home. How many golfers that are watching this right now are at home and say, I am a golfer? Raise your hands at home or type on the screens, I'm definitely a golfer. Now, let's pause and let's look at the person that you're sitting next to that raised their hand and said, I'm a golfer and laugh at them because we realize that a lot of people say they're golfers, but they're really not golfers, right? So let me, let me illustrate it this way. I like to say that I'm pretty okay at golf. I'm not fantastic or I would be playing on the tour on Sundays, but I'm okay at golf. I've actually played many, many times with many, many different people. And the one thing that almost always seems to happen with whoever I'm playing with in particular is the person that in their brain thinks that they are a golfer. And literally they play like twice a year. You know what I'm talking about? And that person usually has this mindset. If I take my club and I swing my club as hard as I can, then I will be a golfer and I can accomplish. The harder that I swing, then the better I am. So the logic for many supposed golfers is this. It's kind of like, I'm gonna swing as hard as I can and try to hit that ball as far as I can. And that is the logic of a lot of golfers. If I can swing so hard to where I come out of my shoes, then I've accomplished what I would call a successful swing. But here's the truth, friends. The real logical reality of golf is this. If you swing like that, then maybe, just maybe, one out of every 30 of your swings is gonna go straight. Because your mindset is, I'm just gonna swing as hard as I can. And here's the truth. Why is that? Because most of your swings, if you've got that mindset that you're gonna grip it and rip it and swing as hard as I can, then here's what's gonna happen on most of your swings. You're gonna hit it and you're gonna be like, yes! Oh my gosh, what just happened? It didn't go as far as I thought it would. And why is that? Because any golfer really knows that golf is a game of precision. It's a game of subtlety. All right, the reality, friends, is this. If your club face is off at the point of impact, just a millimeter, just a millimeter, the ball still may go long, it still may go far, but the reality is if it's off just a millimeter, it will never, ever, ever go straight. You know what that makes for, friends? It makes for a long day on the golf course, a very long one. And all you're doing is fooling yourself into thinking that you are ready for this, that you're a golfer. You're a real golfer. But by the end of the round, guess what? Your score's not 77. Your score's 127. And that's because you've tried over and over and over all day long to do what you thought was right and swing as hard as you can. And you're equating to that as playing golf. Right? So the question I have for you with this illustration is, are you really, really, really playing golf? Are you really, really, really a golfer? Sadly, sadly when I ask that, there's some guys that are behind this uh, screen right now and they're saying, yeah, I still think I'm a golfer. And I would probably challenge you and say, I don't think you're really a golfer. You're not actually playing golf, you're just hacking. You're just hacking. My point is, you're being deceived. You're being duped. You're doing it to yourself over and over. You have the wrong mentality. You have the wrong mechanics. And how do you know? When I said last week, right, how do you know that you're being deceived? When reality hits. Because you're deceiving yourself and the truth will hit because your score will reflect your deception every single time at the end of 18. The number one rule in golf can be applied in life as well in regards to this tactic that we're talking about called deception. It's this. It's learning how to hit the ball straight saves you a lot of pain and a ton of time. A ton of time. And guess what, folks? Our enemy knows that if he can get you to believe just a little lie 
long enough and far enough, guess what's going to happen? The final scorecard will always reflect the real damage inflicted. So, PJ, what do we do about this? Well, John wrote about this in chapter 8 and verse 31. He said, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What Jesus, in essence, is saying here is this. When the enemy comes, when the deception arrives, when the little lie knocks on the door, right? You're going to know the truth behind the deception because you know the teachings of Jesus, right? So anybody remember at home when uh, the story about Jesus in the wilderness, when Satan came to tempt him um, and deceive him? And on every single occasion that Jesus was being uh, tempted, uh, how did Jesus respond? He responded with scripture. Let me show you. There's There's three common areas that deception is most often used, even with us, and they were used with Jesus. They're the lust of the flesh, they're the lust of the eyes, and they're the pride of life. And it's worth noting, again, that these are the three primarily, primary areas that, G, that Satan comes to you and I and tries to deceive us. Let's take a look at it with Jesus' story. He comes with the lust of the flesh, and he says, you're hungry, aren't you? And in Luke chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, here's what Jesus said. If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, ready, three words. It is written. Man does not live by bread alone. Then he comes with the lust of the eyes. These kingdoms, these kingdoms can all be yours, Jesus. Luke 4, verses 6 and 8. I will give you all the authority and splendor. And Jesus answered three words. It is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then he comes after the pride of life. Can't you even save yourself, Jesus? In Luke chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. If you are the son of God, Satan says, Throw yourself down here. Now, I just want to quick, quick time out before I finish this verse. Here's a real chilling thought that I want you to ponder upon. Don't miss this. Satan actually uses scripture with Jesus, which is something that is seriously worth noting because that means that Satan actually knows scripture himself. And he knows how to use scripture and twist scripture with you and with me. And that begs to question, doesn't it, with us? Now that we're really thinking about that, I wonder if Satan actually knows more scripture than me. Right? He goes on and he says, he will command his angels, he quotes scripture, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against stone. And Jesus answered with two words this time. It says, do not put the Lord your God to a test. This basically means that you and I can always defend ourselves against the tactic of deception by knowing the word of God. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week when we discuss how we defend ourselves. But Jesus was essentially saying in John chapter 8, if you know scripture, you can defend yourself when Satan comes at you with deception. So if you find yourself in life continually kind of getting beat up over and over with the enemy day after day, then you need to ask yourself a little more often, how much scripture do I really know? Am I even using scripture and defending myself against Satan? And I'm afraid to tell you that for many of us, sadly, many of us don't know a lot of scripture, but we're still trying to fight and we're like swinging at air, missing Satan. You know what we're basically doing when we're trying to fight him without the knowledge of the truth of the word of God? All you're doing is charging hell with a squirt gun thinking that you're going to win. It's not possible and it's not doable. It's time that you pick up your sword And you fight with the weaponry that God has equipped you to fight with. And again, next week we'll talk a little bit more about this and the other areas in which we can resist and we can fight. So make sure you come right back, all right? Here's the second one. He comes at us with temptation. Now what I want you to do with temptation is I want you to think about this tactic through a fisherman's mindset or a fisherman's approach. Satan comes after us with artificial fakes that are basically on a hook. Let me demonstrate for you today. All right, with the first one. 
Now, when I show you this first lure, you're going to know out of the gate, right? That is the dumbest thing in the world. Why would anybody put this at the end of a rod and a line and put it on uh, and, and cast it out and try to fish with something like this? I mean, we, we look at lures and they're, they're kind of cool looking, but naturally we know it's a fake. We know it's not a real shad, right? So we can default and say, seriously, how, how, how stupid and dumb can a fish be? And I would pause right real quick if that's you and say, just be really careful, folks, when you say that. So here's what Satan does with the idea of temptation. He comes at you with a plastic shad. It's not real, it's fake. And let's just take this for example. Let's say it's called bitterness. Let's say it's called bitterness. And he says to you something like this. Hey, listen, Josh, you've been treated unfairly, haven't you? Right, or you know you don't deserve to feel this way, Josh. Or I can't believe that they did that to you, Josh. You know, you know that they have no reason to do that to you. And then he changes it up and he comes at you harder and he says this. You know, the only way, Josh, for you to make things right is if you start to hate. You start to hate. And just as we chuckled a few minutes ago about how fish fall for a lure like this, you start slipping and sliding towards hate and bitterness manifests itself. And guess what, friends? Here's what happens. You're hooked. You're absolutely hooked and you've fallen for his temptation and you've taken the bait of bitterness. And now guess what? Your life is off track. All right. But he also works in other ways and he comes at you with the other ideas. Look at this one, man. I wish it was, this one kind of squeaked. This is a little uh, plastic frog. And once again, we look at it and we say, that, that's so fake. I, I can't believe fish are so dumb. What in the world? How would they fall for that? And again, I would say, be careful, friends. Be very, very careful when you make fun of a fish, when you act like one quite a bit. Right. So he comes at you with a different lure, with a different temptation. And let's say this, this plastic frog represents lust. It represents lust. And he comes to you and he whispers in your ear over and over, you know, your marriage isn't all that you hope for, right, Josh? You know that. You, you know that, 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 that he doesn't love you anymore like he did from the beginning. That's, that's why you're looking at porn. You're getting satisfaction elsewhere because they don't love you that way anymore. Or you, you, know, you know, Josh, she can't really stand you. So why else would she keep nagging you all the time? And then he changes it up after you've been nibbling at it, nibbling at it. And, and then you, he changes up his wording and he says, listen, you realize, Josh, that the only way for you to make things right in your love life is for you to cheat, for you to cheat. And just like that, friends, just like the, frit, the fish was so dumb and gullible, you've taken the hook, you've fallen for the temptation, you've taken the bait of unfaithfulness, and now, guess what? Your life is completely off course. I'm, I'm really serious, folks, I'm serious here. How many times do we have to fall for these tactics over and over and over that he whispers in your ears and he keeps saying, you need this. God doesn't understand. You're different. The Bible doesn't make sense. How many times? But let's be real fair today, okay? Because I'm human and I understand. Sometimes the problem is, is it's almost irresistible because it looks so real right? It looks so real that it's actually, oh my gosh, <laughs> check out that. That is a real worm and it looks juicy because reality is sometimes sin is extremely juicy. It's sexy. It's, it's even alive. And you know what's crazy? The Bible even says that sometimes that sin is actually fun. Gosh, he almost slipped out of my hands. That's crazy. But let me ask you something. How long does the moment really, really last? Right? I'll tell you how long it lasts. Because it's fun, it's real, it's juicy. But it only lasts until Satan sets the hook. Until Satan sets the hook. Now, bear with me here because I think that worm had the Rona. And I just need to clean off my hands a little bit, okay? All right? And, um, but here's the deal. I'm here to tell you today 
that in addition to the Bible telling you that sin is fun, it goes on to say very clearly that it's only fun for a season. You know what that means, right? That means it's only as fun until you eat the worm and the hook is set. And let me tell you something today, friends. Personally, I understand this. The hook hurts. It's filled with pain, physical, emotional, mental, across the board, heartache and pain. When I was about seven years old, we owned a resort on Table Rock Lake in the Ozarks of Missouri. And I would fish and crawdad hunt all the time. And there was this one time that I was fishing from the shore, which is rarely, you just rarely catch anything from the shoreline. You gotta be in a boat or on a dock. But I was fishing and I was just a fishing enthusiast and I was casting out and reeling in, casting out and reeling in. And there was this one time that I caught, I I hooked what I believe to be a rock bass. Now, if you know anything about fishing, a rock bass is basically what it is, a rock that we just add a bass to it so we act and think that we got a fish. And I had hooked a rock bass, but I didn't know that. And I thought I hooked something. And finally, I was trying to wiggle it loose, and I did, and I yanked it, and the hook went flying back behind me. But there wasn't about, but about 12 to 14 feet in the line. So I thought, I'm not going to reel this in. I'm just going to cast it back out. And as soon as I casted it back out, I heard a little and felt a little thump in the back of my back. And immediately after the little ting, I started to feel immense amount of pain. And I realized, oh my gosh, even as a seven-year-old kid, I hooked my back. And I ran screaming, crying, and throbbing all the way back up to the resort. Dad, 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 help me, help me. I've hooked myself. I've hooked myself. And my dad bent me over and he looked and he said, yes, you sure have hooked yourself. Now, here's what's interesting about hooks, friends. Hooks aren't just one swivel. There's also a little bit of an edge on the the backside called a barb. So naturally, my dad could not pull that hook back out where it went in. Get this. I'm sitting there in between my dad's legs, just shaking, shaking. And my dad has to pop the hook up through a separate piece of skin so he can take the clippers and clip it and pull it out. I'm here to tell you today, physically, I know... A hook hurts, and it's painful. And and I'm telling you that day after day, the reason why you're in pain and heartache is because you keep taking the hook of temptation. And here's something else you need to know about this idea with Satan and how serious he is in attacking us in this particular area. Fishermen don't go fishing without the expectation of catching fish. I never just got in a boat when I lived on the lake and thought, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to fish, but I'm hoping I don't catch anything. That doesn't happen. And our enemy is no different. He's got a lot of bait in his tackle box, which attract a lot of fish, and his arsenal is big, and he's relentless. So PJ, help me out. How do I defend myself against this tactic? Real simple. We'll talk more about it next week, but I'll tell you this. First and foremost, start looking for the hook. Listen, if it looks too good to be true, it usually is. It usually is. Let's look at the last one today. Accusation. Accusation. Now, here's what's crazy about this one. Once Satan gets you to actually fall for a lie, Satan is relentless. And he will always come back to you after you've done it And he'll rub your nose in it. And he'll say things like this. You know, Josh, you're really a lousy Christian. A real Christian, Josh, would never have made that decision to begin with. Satan comes to you over and over, usually right after you fail. And he'll say things like, you're never going to measure up. You're never going to measure up until you get your next raise. You'll never measure up until you get your next car. You'll never measure up until you see what's next on that screen that you keep flipping through. You'll never measure up unless you have perfect kids. You'll never measure up unless you look differently than you do, or you're smarter than you are, or you dress different than you are. Please, friends, please get this today. 
He's lying to you. When he does that, yes, you failed. You failed. I get it. You made a poor choice, and God's grace can, can cover you if, you if you ask for forgiveness and repent of that sin. But he's lying to you, and he's setting you up for a bigger fail, fail only to come back to you to accuse you again of blowing it. Here's something that I've learned, and you need to know about Satan today, friends. Satan will never, ever, ever take ownership of the mistake that you make. Never. His tactics are nothing more than a lie. He'll always leave you feeling as if you have no value and you're a loser because you fell for it. And I want you to hear something today, friends. That lie about your value is straight from the pit of hell. Because I'm here to tell you today, friends, your value is not measured that way. Your value is not measured by the mistakes that you keep making over and over. Your value is measured by what someone is willing to pay for you. That's how you know one's true value. So you want to know what your value is today? God tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were making the mistakes, while we were sinning, while we were following over and over for, for Satan's tactics in the middle of all of that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So regardless of what Satan thinks of you and what he wants you to think about yourself, know this today, friends. Know that Jesus Christ thinks you're pretty special. He thinks you're pretty valuable, special enough to actually die on a cross for you. And when he did that, he placed a value and a worth into a class and a level where Satan cannot attack you. He can't attack you. And if you can get that today, then get this. If you can believe and receive God's gift of grace... Then and only then will you begin to realize and start to understand what your real worth is. I want you to think about that. As we wrap this up today, I want you to think long and hard. What does it mean to you? How incredible, how like, whoa, blow my mind is it that the creator of the entire universe was willing to pay for your life with his son? That is absolutely amazing. I'll tell you what it means to me. It's priceless. It's priceless. Would you bow your heads in an attitude of prayer at home today? Let me wrap this up. I, at some point in time in your life, folks, you really do need to stop looking through the eyes of the world and through the eyes of the enemy. And you need to realize this about your value. There is no sin that is too big that you can't be forgiven. There is no limitation in your life that God can overcome. And sometimes, sometimes God actually uses the things that you're not to display the things that he is. And sometimes your limitations make you the most effective follower of Jesus because it even makes God more obvious. I'm here to tell you today, friends, you are valuable. You are valuable. Type that in your, 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 your comment sections. Tell somebody that you're sitting next to. Say, I am valuable. Not today, Satan. I'm not going to believe your tactics. Not today. I am valuable. So the real question in closing that I want to leave you with today is this. Have you come to a place in your life that you've realized what your worth is and what your value is today? Have you ever come to a place in which you have personally placed a faith in Jesus Christ and have become what the Bible refers to as born again? I'm telling you, it's really simple. If you haven't today, you can understand and know what your true value is. All you have to do is simple as ABC. You need to admit you're a sinner. 
You admit that you failed. Then you believe. You believe in the value that Jesus paid for you on the cross. You believe that he died for your sins. And then you commit. You commit your life to Jesus Christ. A, B, C. Admit, believe, and commit. Listen, friends, still all heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If at any point that you've been watching this message today and you've realized that you need a little more info, a little more assistance with knowing how or what to do in response to the Holy Spirit's like leading in your life today, maybe you need some more prayer. Maybe you need some more information on how, to I, 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 how do I get saved. Would you be willing to let us help you today? If you're watching from the Facebook platform, all you do is just DM the COC Facebook page and say, I need prayer, or I'd like to know a little bit more about salvation. And if you're watching from the open network today, all you gotta do is just push the live prayer button and tell us what it is, or raise your hand right now on the screens and say, I'd like to commit my life to Jesus Christ. That's as simple as it is. Man, I hope we have showed you a little bit today about why Satan's knocking. And what are his tactics? And I want to invite you back next week online as we wrap this series up and we talk a little bit more about how we can defend ourselves and fight right. Because God has not left you unprepared. He has given you an arsenal and he has given you preparations and we need to know what they are so we can fight right. Let me pray for us in closing today. Lord, I praise you. I give you all of the glory. I thank you that you have shown us from the word of God some of the schemes and tactics of our real enemy. And I pray that you would open our eyes, help us personalize, recognize, personalize, and strategize the real enemy. And I pray that this series has been enlightening for everybody that's watching. And now we're looking. We're looking just like he's looking for us. And we realize he's out for blood. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy us. So we need to learn how he does that and then learn how to fight right. Would you please empower us the rest of this week as we get prepared and go into battle tomorrow and then come back online next week and learn about the arsenal that you have left us to fight right. We pray all of this in your precious and your holy, holy, holy son's name. Amen.
Jesus, we thank you so much for this service today. Jesus, we give it all up to you. We are set free by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus, we are so grateful for this time of worship today. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Online COC, make sure to come back next week for week three of When the Devil Comes Knocking. Have a great day.